for inviting me. I hope uh, this next one hour will be somewhat useful for you. You will learn something something new out of this uh, one and a half hour session. Uh, so how I will try to divide my time is uh, just five ten minutes. I will. How many minutes did you go? First five ten minutes I uh, talk about myself, uh, a company, what we do. After that. Uh, I will cover basics of basic concept of performance based design for 10-15 minutes, and after that I will demonstrate a simple example that I did during my masters for maybe 30-40 minutes. And after that, uh, time permitting, I will show you some guidelines that are existing in uh, US for performance based design that are uh, sort of like the reference for performance based design, and. Uh, and I will answer any questions that you might have related to this subject or any other, uh, any other subject. So I work at uh, Optimum Design. Uh, it was started by my father. Uh, he has been designing buildings for the last uh, 25 years. He has designed uh, more than uh, more than 15 crore square feet of uh, uh, built-up area. I am relatively new in that field. I have been working in design for the last 4-5 years. I did my master's in uh, structural engineering from UCLA and there I also worked as a research assistant for uh, Professor Burton for 6-7 months. I did not continue for PhD but I worked as a, as a research assistant during my master's. So I was able to publish my work. Uh, I did one publication in earthquake spectra which is uh, considered a very uh, reputable journal in structural engineering field and then one uh, publication in structural safety. So what I worked on is, uh, I worked on quantifying aftershock collapse vulnerability of, uh, of <coughs> infiltrating buildings. So in simple words, in simple words, when main shock aata hai, then there is some damage that is sustained by building which re reduces its uh, collapse uh, capacity for uh, aftershocks. So we worked on quantifying that, that how much collapse uh, capacity is reduced um, and uh, then basing it on the intensity of uh, main shock, how much is that affecting the collapse capacity. So, uh, moving on, Th these are uh, so some of our projects, uh, uh, some relatively big ones are like in uh, Crossing Republic, we have done more than 80-90% of towers in that area. This is a Saya building in front of Shipka Mall, uh, you might have seen. Bulk, this is a super tech uh, Cape Town, but well, uh, bulk of our project is in Noida, Greater Noida, Gurgaon area, but we have uh, projects uh, throughout the country. But bread and butter area is uh, this Greater Noida, Noida, Gaziabad, and uh, Gurgaon. So now I'll start with the with the subject of this presentation. First, uh, I have two slides basically outlining the very high level difference between code based design that is design that we are much more familiar with that we practice in day to day life and performance based design. So uh, code based design as you all might be <coughs> familiar. Uh, codes exist which help us to define the force that would be applied on the building that force is based on the weight of the building, uh, building location, that is zone of the building, uh, the utility of the building, that gives us the, that helps us to allow, find the force acting on the building, which is used for design of the building. So the factor, the AH factor formula, you must be knowing, um, SAY, S A Y G, uh, I by two R into Z. So the, all these, all these, 
variabilities are covered within that single formula that gives us the force that is acting on the buildings and it also gives us a method to divide that force on each story and then we are able to get the force for which the building is to be designed or the member of the buildings are to be designed. So what, what is the, the basic assumption in code based design is uh, you know what is uh, can anybody tell me why is the R factor there in that formula to calculate response addition factor but uh, why why do we want to include that factor what ductility so R factor is related to ductility of the building more more ductile we think of the expert experts of uh, the people who are formulating the codes, the expert of the field, the more ductile they think the building is going to be, the more R factor it will have. So R fact the forces are reduced by that R factor and then we design for those forces. Usually for R factor there is no basis as such to quantify ductility is it's based mostly on experience of people who have been designing buildings for many many years and who are considered uh, as expert <coughs> in this field so if uh, if we don't apply our factor what will happen is we will we'll get very uneconomical buildings so there might be, you might see buildings with which might look like just a column with some maybe a room in between somewhere so this uh, there has to be a balance between economy and uh, safety so this balance is maintained by R factor many many of the buildings might never see an earthquake uh, for which they are designed in their lifetime so to maintain economy this R factor is used and lastly after applying the R factor we assume building should be elastic while bearing the forces. It should not go into non-linear region. All the materials should remain elastic while bearing all the forces that it is being designed for. And lastly, we use specified material properties. So what is specified material properties is uh, if you buy a reinforcement, uh, it says FE500 and 500 is the specified strength of that material and we use that number for design so th that was basic of very you know broad uh, level or broad perspective basis of code design now this this is uh, similar basis for performance based design so first assumption is in performance based design in it is you can say mostly an American concept. Some people decided, or they maybe 10, 15 years back, that code is very restrictive for them, and then maybe they decided that they are beyond code, or, or they know more than people who are writing the code. So they devised this uh, concept of performance-based design. It was developed at the same time when uh, software in civil engineering fields were becoming so sophisticated that they could do such an analysis required by this concept. So broadly it is uh, performance based design is more subjective. You can say you have to take informed decision, designer has to take informed decision himself, other while in code based analysis those decisions have been already taken for him by the code committee or by the people who write the code. So, uh, what the broad uh, broad outline of performance based design is that uh, the first of all, the promoter of the building sits down with the architect, the geotechnical person, and the structure engineer, and he. First of all, it has to be decided what kind of performance he is looking to achieve from his building. So, 
not all buildings have to be designed for the same code. In code-based analysis, this is this factor is uh, taken care of by I importance factor. Uh, does everybody know what importance factor is? Um, importance factor. So it is about the importance of buildings on the basis of their importance, it is decided. Yes, exactly, and uh, it can take uh, values from one, one to point one point five. Point. So there is not a lot of variation, but this utility of a building has it has been tried to take that into account in <coughs> the code based design also, but one to one point five is not a huge huge variability. So uh, when we decide what is the utility of my building, so maybe somebody who is designing a parking structure does not have to uh, does not need the same amount of safety in his building as somebody who is designing a hospital. So the performance based design is in a way it tries to treat them more distinctly than just importance factor of 1 and 1.5. So uh, the performance level, let's say, in what could be a decision uh, taken by the developer or the structural engineer of, of that building, say maybe I have a, a regular building or a parking structure, I could be looking at this line. So this this line is sort of quantifying what performance is expected from what level of earthquake. So I. Let's say I have a hospital or a nuclear plant, then I might be looking at this line. I don't want, I want that uh, that building to be functional after any any kind of earthquake. Parking structure, maybe it's okay if there's a huge earthquake and it suffers irreparable damage and it's not usable after the after a big earthquake. But I want to hospitals and fire stations to be usable after a big earthquake. So this performance level is decided uh, before starting the design of a building. This performance level is nothing <coughs> but it has divided earthquakes into service level and in this chart it has divided them into frequent, occasional, rare and uh, very rare earthquake. And similarly, these are the performance level that are defined in this chart. So, in each of the earthquake, you might expect building to be anywhere between fully operational to near collapse. Which so, before starting this process, we have to decide where our building has to be in this graph. And after analysis, there is not exactly any code for performance based design, but there are some guidelines that have been printed by uh, ATC and uh, National Institute of Science and Technology in the US, which is like reference guidelines which can be used. But it's not a hard and fast code. Code in design, it's uh, like a law. If, uh, it, if it can be identified that a structure engineer did not follow the code, then he is uh, liable to be prosecuted by the code for that. But in performance-based design, it is called the guideline because it, not, it is not as hard and fast as a code or a law. So, in this, secondly, no response reduction factor is used. So we use forces as they come. Whatever force that, let's say, a uh, rare earthquake will apply on the building, we will analyze the building for that force. We will not reduce it based on the expected ductility of the building. And we use expected properties in performance-based design. Now, how, how are expected properties different from specified properties? Yes. Normally, when let's say the uh, IS or IESI allows somebody to print FE500 on their packaging, 
they have to satisfy a certain condition that 95% of the samples will have to exceed exceed that value. So, but if you start testing FE 500 T, normally the mean value of strain would be greater than 500. So we use that mean value of strain in performance based design, which is higher, usually higher than the, uh, the specified properties of material. Now, uh, immediately somebody might ask a question, how, how higher are these value from uh, specified properties? So there are, well, again, in these guidelines, there are some reference for